Hello and welcome to this course on software optimization fundamentals. At the bottom line, this course is all about software optimization. So that's optimizing your code for a specific property, whether that's speed or space or energy consumption or something else entirely. Usually we're going to be talking about optimizing for speed though, making your code run faster. And primarily we'll be exploring this by trying to better understand how programs execute on modern general purpose computer architectures. Now, computer architectures change over time, of course, and thus so do the methods of making things fast or optimizing for certain variables. But in this course, we're going to aim for a fairly general overview that should be relatively accurate as of 2015, and hopefully for a reasonable period thereafter. Now, I am going to be assuming a basic understanding of some programming concepts in this course. So I expect you to be familiar with the concept of conditional branching and iteration, but I'm going to try not to assume any particular knowledge of any specific programming language. So let's go ahead and jump right into it. In this video, we're primarily going to be talking about the CPU or the processor. As I suspect you know, the CPU or central processing unit is the piece of kit responsible for computation in most day-to-day -day program execution. I have a diagram here of a very basic example CPU, and if we take a look inside, we'll see a few bits and pieces that modern general purpose processors, at least in the abstract, usually have at a bare minimum. And I really do want to emphasize that modern processors are much more complex than this. This is just a very bare bones, simplified model of a processor to try and help you understand the basic concepts. So let me go through and explain these pieces one by one. Registers are essentially just very fast sections of memory within the CPU. These provide fast storage units for the processor to perform computation with. So in my example processor here, we have registers R1, R2, and R3. And these can just hold values and their values can change. So maybe we have these values, maybe these change to these values, maybe these change to these values. These are just very fast storage units within the CPU itself. Now, along with these storage locations, we actually need some kind of mechanisms or units within the CPU to perform certain types of calculations. Typically, general purpose CPUs have one or more ALUs, arithmetic logic units, to perform numerical calculations. So in this example here, let's just say we only have a single ALU, and this may contain circuits for adding numbers, subtracting numbers, performing bitwise operations on data, and so on. Now, modern processors often have other computational units alongside ALUs. So most processors today also have FPUs, for example, which are floating point units, which contain circuits to do fast calculations with fractional floating point numbers. But we're not going to talk about these units right now. For now, we're just going to focus on the ALUs, which can perform basic arithmetic and logical computations. Now our third component here is kind of the heart of the processor, the control unit. As you might have guessed from its name, the control unit essentially directs the operation of the CPU. So it usually has communication channels to the other sections of the processor. The main job of this basic control unit is to interpret and execute instructions that the CPU has been given. Now let's talk a bit about clock speed. So the clock speed or clock rate of a processor is the rate at which the processor is running. More specifically, this usually refers to the frequency of synchronized electrical pulses within the CPU so that all the parts can work in synchronization. Clock speed is typically measured in hertz, which is the measurement of cycles per second. And in this particular case, we're usually talking about pulses per second. Because the CPU can perform some kind of meaningful operation each time we get an electricity pulse, we often talk about the time it takes the CPU to do something in terms of CPU cycles, the number of these electricity pulses it took for the CPU to do a certain operation. So if a processor has a 3 gigahertz clock speed, that means it has a clock speed of 3 billion hertz. That's 3 billion cycles per second. And because the processor can do 3 billion things in one second, this works out to a third of a nanosecond per cycle for a processor running at a 3 gigahertz clock speed. At the end of the day, optimizing software for speed usually comes down to using less CPU cycles. So if we have a third of a nanosecond per cycle, then if a CPU operation takes approximately three cycles to complete at this clock speed, then it will take around one nanosecond. That's one billionth of a second to finish. So all this talk of CPU operations may be leading you to the question, well, what operations can my CPU perform? And the answer is that your CPU can execute the instructions in its instruction set. The instruction set of a CPU is the set of fundamental operations that you can make your CPU perform. All the programs executing on your computer are just some series of instructions within your CPU's instruction set. Instructions typically correspond directly to actions or computations to be performed within the CPU, and instructions are fed to the control unit to initiate this action. So if we go through an example program here, we have step one, move a number into register one. We then have step two, add 10 to register one, and then step three, send the value in register one to the monitor. This is a program, it's just a series of instructions for the CPU to perform. 
The control unit can't understand our instructions in English, of course, so we have to write them in binary. I'm expecting you to have some familiarity with binary, but essentially if you don't, binary is just a number system consisting of ones and zeros. And in this case, for my imaginary processor, I've just made some particular patterns of ones and zeros correspond to some particular instructions. This sort of dictionary from binary sequences to instructions really defines the instruction set for a particular processor. And because different processors can have different instruction sets and can encode different instructions in different ways, so using different patterns of binary digits, you can't guarantee that binary like this written for one processor is going to work on another processor. So for example, I know for a fact that this binary I've written here, if I try and execute this on the CPU that's actually running in my computer, it's not going to do this, it's not going to work. So I'd have to actually look up the binary sequences for particular instructions for my particular CPU if I wanted to rewrite this program so it actually worked on the CPU in my machine. So let's pretend we're this imaginary processor and we're actually going to go through and execute this program, this series of instructions. So we have a clock cycle counter here. So far we've been through zero CPU cycles. So first off, we're going to need to execute this first instruction, which is to move a number into R1. So let's say the sequence of binary digits gets fed into the control unit. It then interprets it and takes action on it and decides to put the number five into register one. And let's say that whole process took one clock cycle. Okay, so next up, we need to execute instruction two here. So again, we can feed this sequence of binary digits to the control unit. It can then read and interpret this instruction to know it's supposed to add 10 to register one. And then it can go ahead and do that. So let's say in this example it takes one cycle to go ahead and send things over to the ALU into the adding circuit. And then let's say it takes another cycle, another pulse of electricity within the CPU for that addition to complete, so we get the value of 15 in register 1. And next we want to look at instruction number 3 because we're going through them sequentially. So, so far we have three clock cycles elapsed, one for the first instruction, two for the second instruction, and now the control unit can read and interpret this last instruction, and let's say that takes another clock cycle to send that out to the monitor. And there we have it, our program has finished executing and the value 15 has been sent to the monitor. In this example, we took four clock cycles. So if our CPU was running at a clock speed of three gigahertz, then these four cycles would take about 1.3 nanoseconds to finish in total. You really do have to appreciate that modern CPUs are very fast. All of that stuff could have just happened in about 1.3 nanoseconds. Now this set of binary digits we just executed here really is our program for this particular CPU. If this program were to be saved on disk as an executable file, it would have to hold this series of binary digits because these represent the instructions we want the CPU to execute. Again, keep in mind though that this particular set of binary digits is only valid for a particular processor that uses the instruction set that we designed this program for. So that, for example, the binary sequence 1111 is going to send the value at register 1 to the monitor. Remembering what specific set of binary digits corresponds to a particular instruction on your particular processor can really make writing programs quite tiresome. So we have an abstraction over this called assembly code. At its core, instead of writing the binary directly, we can write textual representations of each instruction, which can then get translated roughly on a one-to-one -one basis to actual machine instructions by a program called an assembler. So for our example here, if I make up some assembly language for our imaginary CPU, we might be able to write this assembly code on the left and have that translate on a roughly one-to-one -one basis to the machine code on the right. And you can see how it might be much easier to work with and reason about the code on the left over the code on the right. It's much, much more obvious to see what we're doing through the assembly code on the left. Now, of course, because assembly code is tied to a particular instruction set, it has the same portability issues as machine code. So if I write assembly code for one processor, I can't necessarily guarantee it's going to execute on a different processor with a different instruction set. But it's usually hugely convenient to be able to write in this slightly abstracted textual form rather than writing in raw binary. So that's all I wanted to talk about in this first video. Essentially, the core of this is that it's all about the CPU and its instruction set, and optimizing programs for speed is usually about minimizing the number of cycles that the CPU or CPUs take. So that is all for this video. I will catch you next time.